Let's turn in our Bibles tonight, if you would, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. We've made it this far in our study in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I hope that you've enjoyed this study half as much as I have. It certainly has been an interesting book to study and to present to you. And we come now to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 this evening for the purpose of our study. We'll take just the first half of this chapter, but you'll notice as we begin reading the text in just a moment that the writing in this section of the book of Ecclesiastes, much like chapter 7, is reminiscent of the writing style of Solomon in the book of Proverbs. And in fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and chapter 11 uh, are made up of short statements of truth and wisdom that the wise man is sharing with us, which he has learned. And these are godly truths. These are helpful truths for our lives, which we can apply. And then in chapter 12, uh, he's going to come to his conclusion about all that he has seen and observed in life and what he thinks is the right way to pursue and the right way to live. But here in chapter 10, the first 10 verses tonight, I've titled the message this evening, Wisdom is Profitable, and I took that title from verse number 10, which we'll get to in just a moment. But let's begin reading in verse number 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses." There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Wisdom is profitable. And I want to to instruct us a little bit tonight from the scriptures in the sense that wisdom must be developed in our lives. Wisdom is not something that comes naturally to any of us. In fact, all of us start life out in the, in the category of a person who is simple. And if we're not careful and very calculating in our choices in our life, we'll find that we will quickly move from being a simple person to being a scorner or a fool because of our propensity towards rebellion and rejecting the truth of God. The wise man seems to have understood this, and by this point in his experience of all that he's observing in life, he has come to the conclusion that wisdom is a worthy pursuit. And now in chapter 10 and 11, he's going to share some things with us that are words of wisdom, things by which we can order our life. You notice he starts off in verse 1 with with a fragrant picture for us, dead flies, Dead flies, what a picture that is. I don't know if you've ever been in the barn and seen one of those fly tapes that catches the flies on it. My grandpa always used to have those hanging in his barn. And when you'd go in and you'd see every possible sticky part of that tape was covered with the dead bodies of flies. And I would often wonder, I don't think this is doing much good anymore. Maybe we need to put another one of these up. Of course, it didn't matter how many flies you caught. There always seemed to be more flies around in the air. You never could quite get rid of them. I also don't know if you've ever seen dead flies in a closed container. And then maybe taken the lid off of that container and gotten a whiff of what is inside. That's the picture that the preacher is painting for us with his words 
when he tells us that dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Now, the apothecary in Bible days at this time was the place where you would go to get medicines mixed and perhaps you could get some sweet-smelling oils to anoint your body. Uh, sometimes these apothecaries would mix up the, the oils that would be used in anointing the dead bodies of people who had passed away. And the idea is that this apothecary, he specialized in making things smell good. His shop was known for a place where you could go and smell sweet things. Some of you ladies like to go to bed and uh, bath and body works and, and sniff all the candles. I don't know how you can smell anything in there. I get a headache just walking within 300 yards of that place. My head starts pounding from all the smells. But uh, I, I know that my mom always liked to go in there and she'd sniff the different candles and find out which one she liked and then maybe buy something like that or some lotions or something else that she'd bring home. And, uh, you know, you go into a place like that to smell good. You, you go in there to find things that are pleasant to your nose, to, that you would enjoy smelling. But how would you like opening a container and finding inside of there, inside of there, there's liquid and dying flies that are floating on the surface and maybe some maggots wriggling around in the middle of that. And you take a sniff and it smells dead and rotten. That's what he's communicating. And you say, well, how could such a thing happen in the apothecary? The truth is that even though the smells from this shop were usually sweet, the environment required maintenance. And that's exactly the point that he's making in verse number one. Because if flies would get into the oils, it could wreak havoc in a short time and make for an unwanted scene. It would definitely not be good for business. And just like that, he says, it is possible for a person who is known for wisdom and honor to ruin their good reputation with just a little bit of indiscretion and folly. Just a little bit of foolishness, just a little bit of sin, just a little bit of indiscretion in a response or a reaction, and all of a sudden someone who has had a reputation for wisdom, they've had a reputation for honor, they've been someone maybe that was looked up to by other folks, and all of a sudden people say, well, wait a second, something's not adding up. Just by way of illustration tonight, if I say the name... David, what do you think of? I'll bet it doesn't take long before the name Bathsheba comes to your mind. For all the good things that David did and the, the wonderful character that he had and the heart for God that he displayed, his name is linked with Bathsheba in every one of our minds because of his indiscretion. When you think of Solomon, you could... Think of him as the wisest man on the earth. You could think of him for building the temple. But I think if you think about him for just a couple of minutes, it won't be long till you start thinking about the man who took so many wives that he lost his mind and he went into idolatry and turned his back on God. And you say just a little bit of indiscretion, just a little bit of folly affected his testimony and his reputation. I'd like to say to our young people, your reputation is a precious thing. Guard it. Be careful about the indiscretions that you can be tempted towards. The things that you might think, well, it, it won't hurt. Uh, just going to have a little fun. Just going to do a few little things. How many young people have literally ruined their life by posting something online in an indiscreet moment that in the future was... Uh, brought against them and they lost the opportunity to have a job that they wanted. They lost the opportunity to pursue a career that they had always wanted to pursue. And for what? Because of a moment of indiscretion posting something online. Be careful about your reputation. It is a precious thing. And a reputation is very easily soiled. If we're not careful, we'll find that we can spend our whole life building our reputation by pursuing after wisdom and, and, and building a reputation of honor, but then do something foolish and it causes people's opinion of us to be changed. 
So be careful about your reputation. It's a special and precious thing, and you ought to guard it carefully. Of course, don't be more worried about what everybody thinks about you than you are about what God thinks about you. And ultimately, if you're careful to live with integrity before the Lord who's always watching, your reputation will take care of itself. But tonight, be instructed with this wisdom that a reputation can be ruined easily. Notice then, second of all, in verses 2 and 3, he speaks about wisdom being revealed by our choices. Now tonight, how many of you are left-handers? All right, no offense to the left-handers. But in verse 2, he says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. And I, the Bible doesn't say that there's anything inherently wrong with using your left hand to write and to eat and whatever else you might use your left hand for. But in the Bible, it's usually the left hand that is used when speaking about someone going in the wrong direction. And in contrast, the right hand is the place of blessing and authority. It's the direction that is most often associated with the right path, with going in the right direction. So notice in verse 2 what he's saying, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. In other words, what's in his heart is he wants to go the right way. He wants to please the Lord. He wants to walk in the way of wisdom. That's where his heart is at. But a fool's heart is at his left. That means the fool is always wanting to go in the wrong direction. Deep down inside, what he really wants to do is his own thing. He wants to rebel against God's truth. He wants to live in his own way. He wants to walk according to the beat of his own drum. And that's what is in his heart. Do you know tonight that your life direction is determined by what is in your heart? You see somebody living a certain way and you say, I don't know what happened to them. Well, what happened to them is that what was in their heart came out. There's no mystery in this. We can be fooled about what's in somebody's heart. People can cover over what's in their heart for a while, but eventually give them enough time and give them enough space to do what they want to do and people will go in the path that their heart has established. They're going to follow the thing that they want to do. People's choices are telling you something about the path that they have established in their heart. They're telling you something about the condition of their heart. Tonight, you can try to hide it, but ultimately what's on the inside is going to come out. And there will be no mystery about what it is that you wanted all along. And so the lesson in this is that, yes, we ought to be careful to tend the heart. This is why in the book of Proverbs, we're told to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's in your heart that you determine the direction that you're going to walk. Now he goes on developing this theme in verse number 3, and he says, Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way... His wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. He's really building on what he said there in verse 2. That the idea here in verse 3 is that a fool is going to try to claim that they're wise. No, 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 I'm wise. I, I'm, I, I'm not a fool. I, I'm definitely not that kind of a person. But all you have to do is watch. All you have to do is pay attention to their choices. All you have to do is observe and give them some time. And you'll find that the fool is eventually going to walk in the path. And it says, he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Now, he didn't put a sign on his back or write it on his car, I'm a fool. But what he does is every choice he makes, as he goes down his path, the path of his own making, he's saying to everyone with his choices, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. Watch me. I'm a fool. Watch what I do. I'm a fool. That's a terrible thing to watch a fool go down their path, especially if you can see where they're headed and you're trying to warn them and you're trying to instruct them, no, don't go in that way. If you go in that way, there's pain, there's suffering, there's consequences in that way. And they they brazenly go in their own path and they say, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. I'm not stupid. Don't tell me I'm a fool. I know exactly what I'm doing except 
God is never wrong. And when God says a path ends in destruction, it always ends in destruction. The wise man understood something here. It's one thing to hear somebody say that they are wise. It's another thing to see the choices that they make. One day, everyone will know whether you are wise or you are a fool. You may be uncomfortable with that. You may say, it's not fair for people to judge me. Too bad. Everybody's judging you. That's life. And, and before you think that that's terrible, you're judging everybody else. The people who don't like to be judged are so busy judging everyone else. So understand tonight that people are watching, they're observing, and they're going to be learning from your choices, whether you are wise or whether you are a fool. Wisdom is revealed by choices. Another way to say this is talk is cheap. If you watch how people live, you'll find out what it is that they really value. And that's exactly what he's saying here in verses 2 and 3. Wisdom is revealed by our choices. But then look at verse 4. He brings another important truth to our attention in verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Now this goes against our American spirit. What do you do when the ruler rebukes you? When the person who's in authority corrects you or says that you did something wrong? What if you didn't actually do something wrong? What if you're falsely accused? What if, what if in your situation you're feeling attacked or it feels like untrue things are being attributed to you? Well, our natural tendency is to rise up and defend ourselves. I'm going to set the record straight. I'm going to, I'm going to tell that ruler what is right and what is wrong. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to let him know. You see, uh, people do this sometimes, uh, these, these videos that circulate around about people who are pulled over by a police officer. And the police officer approaches their car, and they're going to they're gonna tell the police officer, I know the law. I'm going to give you some, a piece of my mind. I'm going to let you know some things. Bad idea. Bad idea. It'd be much better to zip your lip at that moment, even if you think that you're right. Even if you think you know what you're talking about, that's a bad time to pipe up with your inner lawyer to tell the police officer that you know better what he should be doing. What is a better way? Well, a better way when we feel like we're being treated unjustly is to simply be quiet and yield. You know, there's a time for us to be quiet and to wait for the situation that we are in to work its way out. Many of us are too proactive for our own good. And we go about to defend ourselves and to make our way and to, and to, to make sure that things go our direction. And my, we, we, it seems like we have a generation as well of parents who like to do this for their children and go to bat for them and work all the details out and make sure that everything goes their direction. That's very foolish. Doesn't, doesn't work well. Doesn't work well in the real world. Just imagine when your young person gets a job and something goes wrong and, and mommy shows up at the job and tries to get the boss to set things right for their child. Not going to work out. Not going to go well. You see, there's a, there's a truth here and, and I think we need to teach, we all need to learn this, but our, our young people need to learn this, that there's a time to yield. Why? Because yielding pacifies great offenses. A spirit of humility has the ability to calm troubled waters. But when you, I, I think the book of Proverbs says it this way, a soft answer turneth away wrath. But if somebody is upset with you and you come back at them just as hard, what's going to happen? Well, that situation is not going to get resolved. It's not going to get any better. In fact, it's likely going to get worse. And if the person that you're going against has the authority over you, you're in a bad situation. So he says it's important to learn how to yield. 
Sometimes the very best thing that you can do is to yield your rights and your opinion to another person. It may just be the thing that is needed to calm that situation. So often in personal conflicts, and this is talking specifically about interactions with someone in authority, but even just think about in our personal relationships with our family members and our co-workers and our neighbors, so many things could be calmed down just by yielding to the other person, just by not getting into a, a, a big controversy with them. You know, you just, you read about these things that happen sometimes, conflicts between neighbors, neighbors who are fighting over the grass clippings going on my yard and keep them on your yard. Um, not too far here from the church, we, it appears that we have some neighbors who aren't getting along too well with each other. One neighbor has put a fence down along the property line and posted signs along the edge that trespassing will be answered with prosecution. And I'm thinking, well, there's nobody else anywhere near that property line except the people who live right next door. So evidently, there's a problem. You think, is there a better way? Yeah, there's probably a better way than that. There's probably a better way to resolve conflicts. In your home, there's probably a better way to come to conclusions about how things are are to be operated and how things are to be done than to fight and to rise up and defend your point of view. Humility is a better way. We could say tonight that humility is the way of wisdom. Then look at verses 5 through 7. He speaks in these three verses about the tragedy of injustice. There's an evil which I've seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Now I want to point something out very important here in verse 5. And that is that the root of the injustice seems to be coming from the one who is in authority. Now remember, he just told us that when the spirit of the ruler rises up against you... You, you need to humble yourself and not answer. There, there's, a, there's a place here for you to yield. But then he says there's this tragedy when a ruler begins to assert their authority and take advantage of people. And that's what he's talking about in verse 5. He says this, this problem proceeds from the ruler. The ruler is turning things upside down. That means the ruler is practicing injustice. If the person who is in authority or the persons who are in authority begin to practice injustice, what does that do to every segment of society? For instance, if you know that the judge or the magistrate is corrupt and accepting bribes, are you going to honor the law? Well, no, because the law means nothing. The law isn't equally applied. If the king... Is, is perverting things in order to take advantage for himself. Are the common people going to regard the law of the king? No, they're going to say every man is out for himself. What happens when there is corruption in the place of authority is that the entire society is turned upside down. Everything gets turned on its head. And he goes on to illustrate this in verse 6. When this happens, he says, folly is set in great dignity. So things that are foolish, things that are irrational, things that make no sense, things that are the opposite of God's wisdom are exalted to the highest place. And all of a sudden, in order to get honor in this society, you have to do the most ridiculous and foolish things. We could make a lot of applications in our society today, couldn't we? As we think about the fact that folly is set in great dignity. In our society, in our American culture, it seems like in many ways the way to be catapulted to the greatest honor is to do the most ridiculous and foolish things. Things that defy even regular logic or rationale. All right, what else happens? The rich sit in low place. Servants are upon the horses and the princes are walking as servants upon the earth. And what he's illustrating here is that all the order that should exist in society is completely turned upside down. 
And the emphasis in, the, in these verses is that all of a sudden, no one knows what to expect. Life becomes unpredictable. It's like you, you one time, somebody does this thing and right in front of the police and nothing happens. And the next time, somebody does that thing in front of the police and they get the, the highest possible penalty. It's completely irrational. It makes no sense. You, you just have no idea what to expect. The whole society is turned upside down. And he says to him, this is an evil that I've seen under the sun. This is actually something, if you study world history, you will find that this sort of thing happens frequently to great empires when they are at the very end of the time of their ascendancy or their rule. You could, you could for instance, study about the Roman Empire, and you would find that at the end of the time of the Roman Empire, there were tremendous follies that were exalted to the place of highest dignity. And uh, the, the people became so immersed in pleasure and entertainment and everyone was just living for pleasure and entertainment that the greatest good seemed to be having fun and, and, and just indulging yourself and, and doing whatever it was that you want to do. And there's no surprise that that society eventually came crashing down around itself. And tonight, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think there are many parallels to our culture here in the United States of America as we think about how, how many things are turned upside down. Things that are good are called evil, and things that are evil are called good. And, and, and it's said with a straight face and, and a spirit of incredulity that you don't agree with them. They just say it like, I, I can't believe you don't understand this. I, I can't believe that you don't believe this. Are you serious? You don't believe these things? No, I don't believe that. That's not the truth. And all of a sudden, people who believe in things, in things that have been established for generations are the crazy ones. And the whole culture is turned upside down. And the wise man says, this is a tragedy. This is an evil that I see. Then notice in verse 8 and 9, he gives us another tidbit of wisdom. He says, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Now, I, it doesn't seem to me, although some commentators disagree with me on this, but uh, it doesn't seem to me that verses 8 and 9 is just the casual digging of a hole in the ground or breaking a hedge. You know, there, there's times when you've got to take a hedge down. It's in the way. It's gotten overgrown and gangly and it's in the way of progress you need to take it down but I don't think that's what he's talking about I don't think he's talking about just picking up stones out of the field and moving them somewhere or or splitting wood I, I don't think that's what he has in mind rather I believe that here he is teaching us you reap what you sow you see these verses seem to be targeting people who take actions which could harm or diminish another person the person who digs a pit is digging a pit as a trap. They're hoping to trip someone up to catch someone in that pit. Someone who's breaking through a hedge, a hedge was a place of security. It was something that was put around someone's property to keep thieves out. And so it's like they're breaking through that hedge to hurt someone, uh, to somehow uh, to, to come after them, to, to cause damage to them. The idea of removing stones or cleaving wood is that they're damaging the property of another person to somehow take advantage of them. They're harming something that belongs to someone else. And when people act in this way, God is clear that these are selfish and ungodly behaviors which will result in consequences. People who break into other people's houses to steal from them are prone to be met with violence at some point in their life. They're prone to be met with, with severe consequences. It's not the kind of thing that normal people smile upon. People who go around trying to damage other people's property are liable to raise the ire of the citizens of the people who live there. You understand what I'm saying? When you act in these kinds of ways, there are going to be consequences. These are things that sometimes require age to learn. 
People in their youth will sometimes do things like this, thinking that it's funny, thinking this is how you get a laugh. This is how you get attention. This is how you get people to look at you. And if I could just say to our young people, this is the wrong way to get attention. This is sure to get a person into a lot of trouble. And that's exactly what he's telling us. He says, when you are involved in harming other people, you are going to be held accountable by God. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that God says about himself, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God is a God who takes vengeance on sin. And those who take advantage of other people are going to face the wrath of Almighty God. That's a very serious thing. You might say tonight, well, I know some people who've engaged in that kind of behavior and nothing's happened to them. And I would just say, not yet. Not yet. Some people, it takes a little longer till the consequences come. Some people may not even face those consequences in this life. It may be not until they stand before God that they stand to answer for those things. But understand there are consequences and God will hold them accountable. It's very foolish to act in this manner. On the positive side, I would say that you and I should go about in our lives to do the very best that we can to be kind to other people, to meet their needs, to care about them. You know, if there's consequences for tearing down something that belongs to someone else, then I believe that God blesses those who care about other people's property, who care enough to, to look out for their neighbor, who watch out for other people around them and, and try to be a protector and, and, and engage in kind acts. I believe that God cares about that kind of behavior because you and I will reap what we sow. Verse 10, the sixth truth that he shares with us. If the iron be blunt and he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Have you ever used a dull axe? I don't, most of us have, have not ever tried to cut down a tree with an axe. In fact, because of the benefit of modern technology, most of us, don't have to worry about using an axe. We can use things like chainsaws, which are quite handy for cutting through logs and much faster than an axe. But, you know, times when I've gone camping, and, of course, you're not allowed to bring your gas-powered chainsaw, but they made these battery-powered ones that are really quiet now. So, anyway. <laughs> but, you know, when we, were, when we were teenagers and we would go camping, we would always bring a hatchet and an axe and a saw the saw would always get stuck about halfway through, and then we'd go wailing on that log, trying to get it uh, cut down with an axe, and, and we would just keep going at it, and, keep, and the chips are flying. You know, if, if the axe is sharp, it's amazing how quickly you can get through a log. But if the axe is dull, oh, it doesn't work too good. And I remember one time I picked up the chainsaw, and somebody else must have gotten a hold of that chainsaw, sitting in the church garage, and I think they ran it in the dirt and hit a few stones with it. And I went to use it to cut a log, and the smoke was coming, and I, it's not going anywhere. What's happening? Well, you know the truth is, this is what he says. If you wet the edge, if you just took a few minutes to get out your wet stone, your file... And, and, and take a little bit of time to sharpen the teeth on the chainsaw. Take a little bit of time to work the edge on that axe. You'll find that your time will be well invested. Because you could literally spend hours trying to cut down a tree with a dull axe and get almost nowhere. But if you sharpen that axe and you invest maybe, maybe 20 minutes sharpening the edge of that axe so that it's nice and sharp, all of a sudden, your efforts become multiplied. Now, there's a principle that he's teaching us. It's not sharpen your axe before you start working, although that's a good idea. He says, wisdom is profitable to direct. He's, he's talking about us. We're the axe. Our, our mind, our soul is the axe. And we need to sharpen our grip on wisdom. 
We need to grow in the development of wisdom in our lives. As we said at the beginning of the message tonight, none of us was born naturally having wisdom. Wisdom is something that we receive from God through the truth of His Word, but wisdom is more than just the bare facts. It's more than just having knowledge stuffed into our head or memorizing a bunch of verses. Wisdom is special because wisdom is the ability to take that which God has given us and put it to work in the decisions, the daily details of our life. God wants us to learn how to take his wisdom and put it to work in the decisions that we are making on a daily basis. But this kind of wisdom has to be developed and it has to be directed. In other words, to put it this way, wisdom has to be sharpened. You never will quite arrive in the area of wisdom... And something that I believe he's also instructing us about is that wisdom can become dull. Some people think, well, I, I got to a place of wisdom, now I'm here. But the truth is, you can lose wisdom. Because wisdom isn't like a degree that you hang on your wall and point to and say, see, I've got that degree, that guarantees that I know something. No, wisdom is something that has to be used. I, I remember... When I was taking Spanish language classes, there was a phrase that my teacher liked to use, use it or lose it. That's true of language. If you don't use the language that you've learned, eventually it fades in your memory and you lose it. It's the same way with God's wisdom, use it or lose it. You say, well, I come to Sunday school. I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Isn't that enough? I I read my devotions. No, that's not enough. Are you using God's wisdom? Because if you're not putting it to practice in your life, then you're becoming dull. And you're going to find that your life is not going to be as sharp as God wants it to be. You're not going to be going in the direction that you ought to go. Tonight, I hope that you are pursuing after wisdom. That certainly is the emphasis here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, that all of us should be pursuing after wisdom, that all of us should be, should be aspiring to more wisdom, that we all should be trying to grow in wisdom so that we can please the Lord with our life. But honestly, if you want to know about your wisdom, the best way to know is just to look at your choices. Are your choices lining up with God's wisdom? Are you making the kind of decisions that are consistent with what God says is wisdom? Or would it be more accurate to say that your, your choices are indicating that your heart is prone to go in your own direction, to do your own thing, to follow your own path? You're going to find out, are you walking to the right path, to the right hand, or to the left? Are you going after wisdom, or are you going after foolishness? But obviously God's design and God's desire for us is that we would pursue after wisdom. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this passage. And I pray that you would use it in our hearts even as we reflect on and meditate on the things that you've taught us tonight. I pray that you would help us to pursue after wisdom, to be interested in wisdom, to desire wisdom, to develop wisdom in our own lives Father, I pray that you would help us to be people of wisdom. Have your will and your way in each one of our hearts as we seek to follow after you and teach us, Father, what it means to walk in wisdom. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.